Lecture 13, Semaphores. We're going to pick up on the topic of mutual exclusion. In the previous lecture, we talked about the idea of concurrency control through the use of synchronization. We talked about synchronization in general as a topic. With a certain understanding of that, we got into the idea of serialization and how can we get serialization through messages. We've also discovered that uh, serialization is achievable in this way, but the way that we use to achieve it is not sufficient for the other kind of synchronization that we frequently need, and that is mutual exclusion. So I want to talk a little more about mutual exclusion in general. The previous definition was kind of informal. I just said, you know, these things don't happen at the same time. There's only one person that's skiing down the ski hill, that sort of thing. Um, a more formal definition uh, is, you know, events C and D uh, do not happen at the same time. Uh, but there are desirable properties uh, of any mutual exclusion solution that are relevant to evaluating whether or not any solution is any good there are the following six things. First one is that mutual exclusion must apply. Uh, that is to say, whatever strategy you come up with has to work. Uh, if it doesn't work, there's no point to it, and therefore, like, why bother? Uh, that's not a... It's not an acceptable solution if it doesn't work. You know, you, you wouldn't buy a laptop where the laptop doesn't work. You would be disappointed with a calculator if it gave you wrong answers. So whatever solution we have to have has to work, and it has to work in all scenarios uh, that are reasonable. Number two, a thread that halts outside of the critical section must not interfere with other threads. This eliminates any of those strict alternation routines that we have talked about previously, uh, because if you did have something like that, it just would not be okay. You know, thread A terminates, le leaves thread B hanging, that wouldn't be acceptable. Number three, uh, it must not be possible for a thread requiring access to a critical section to be delayed indefinitely. Uh, that is to say that eventually any thread that wants to get to the critical section should get a turn. There's no specific time frame because a critical section could be very short or it could be very long. The lineup could be very short or the lineup could be very long, but that's not bad as long as it takes a finite amount of time uh, and this would eliminate a, um, a solution along the lines of the one where all threads get stuck uh, because they each think another one is in the critical section it would fail on this criterion because threads would in fact be delayed forever number four when no thread is in the critical section a thread that wants to get access should be allowed to enter right away, so there should be no unnecessary waiting in the system. Uh, if a resource is desired and it's not in use right now, I mean, why shouldn't we get it right away? Uh, number five, um, no assumptions are made about what the threads will do or the number of processors in the system. That is to say that we are um, looking for something that is a general solution. It's not okay to say this situation uh, you know, is fine because, well, if we have exactly three threads and they always follow this pattern, you know, then it would work. Uh, maybe in that specific situation it would, but it doesn't make for a good general solution. The last one is actually a bit more of an assumption than a criterion, but a thread remains in the critical section for a finite time only. We'll interpret that as our solution has to provide a way for a thread to indicate that it has left uh, the critical section. Otherwise, you know, we don't know when a turn is done. This uh, also gives us a little bit of... Uh, uh, breathing room, if you will, uh, in that if something really does go wrong, like a, you know, a thread crashes in the, in the middle of a critical section or a process dies while it's holding onto some critical resource, then maybe the system breaks down, but that's not something that we have to handle in our design because, you know, some cleanup handler or something should have been implemented to deal with this, meaning that a thread remains in the critical section for a finite time only. Uh, and if we fail to enforce that in our program, bad things could happen. Okay, so we're going back to, I don't know, a uh, nuclear power plant uh, that may or may not be familiar to you from a TV show that you may or may not have watched. 
All right. Um, we had Alice and Bob, and they worked in uh, the plant at Sector 7G. Uh, and let's imagine that we have a third employee, Charlie, who works on the day shift at the same time as Alice. Uh, and uh, let's imagine that uh, legal regulations require an increase in safety. So we had Alice, who works on the day shift, and Bob, who works on the night shift. But in principle, uh, there is some period of time when nobody is watching the alarms or something if Alice you know, has lunch. So, well, to address that, a solution is, of course, to have a second person who's on shift, and they can't both go to lunch at the same time. Right, so Alice and Charlie uh, are working the same shift, uh, and they have to coordinate their actions such that at least one of them is at their desk at all times, uh, and therefore they can't both you know, meet for lunch at 12.30. If we cannot predict when exactly lunch begins, uh, or exactly how long lunch will last, how do Alice and Charlie coordinate to make sure that they don't take lunch at the exact same time? Uh, and so, uh, if you could predict when lunch would begin and how long it would last, this would be easy. You would have a schedule. You would say, Alice, you take lunch from 11 to 12, and uh, Charlie, you can take lunch from 12 to 13. And that's perfectly fine, uh, and that is a valid schedule, and if everybody sticks to the schedule, and then we have no problem. However, that's not usually what happens in real life. Uh, you know, even if you have a lunch break in your day, um, the employer might not tell you exactly when you can take it. Uh, and even if they do, they say lunch is between you know, 12 and 1, you could potentially be finished a little sooner or something like that. Um, so, yeah, we don't know. So if we don't have a strong way of knowing you know, when this is going to work, um, well, how do we make sure they don't take lunch at the same time. And again, this is another one of those situations where I want you to think about it for a minute and in an interactive class, you would you know, give me a suggestion and I would maybe ask some follow-up questions or maybe uh, tell you about why I don't think that works or why I do think that works. Okay, here's a possible solution. Before Alice wants to go get lunch, Alice calls Charlie. If Charlie does answer, he's at his desk, that means that Alice can say, I'm going to lunch now and I'm going to proceed. They and then Alice leaves. If Charlie doesn't answer, Alice knows for sure that Charlie is not at his desk and therefore Alice can't leave right now. So how long does Alice have to wait? She can call again, uh, actually, you know, constantly, you know, blow up his phone until she reaches Charlie. That's a form of busy waiting. Uh, this ties up a phone line nonstop uh, and is effort intensive for Alice, you know, constantly redialing and waiting for it to ring and everything. So probably we hate that. If Alice doesn't want to do that, there are two options that we could consider. The one that you probably choose, you know, as a... Uh, as a person is something along the lines of wait a period of time, let's say 15 minutes, and call again. Or, second option, leave a message in Charlie's voicemail box saying, please call me back. Then Alice is able to go about her work until she gets a call from Charlie, and as soon as that happens, then Alice can go and leave for lunch. Okay, so calling constantly is a form of busy waiting. We've already discussed that busy waiting is... It is a solution. Alice would not leave for lunch until Charlie answered the call. Um, the, you know, Alice might be res reported to human resources for, uh, for harassment behavior in this scenario. Uh, but you know, uh, it, it would accomplish the safety regulatory goal of making sure that the two people are not both away from their desks at the same time. The wait a while and try again approach is, again, maybe something that you would choose sort of in real life. Uh, but it is not optimal, necessarily. What if Charlie finishes lunch five minutes after Alice calls? Then Alice is waiting ten more minutes to go to lunch than is necessary, and you know, maybe that's unpleasant. You know, maybe Alice is really hungry, and maybe she doesn't want to wait. So, could we do better than that? Sure. Uh, and the you know, leave me a uh, voicemail approach is better, on the assumption, of course, that Charlie checks voicemail regularly and does, in fact, uh, call Alice back. Um, 
professors, you, you may have noticed, might have voicemail boxes, but few of them uh, answer their phones and even fewer of them pick up voicemail <laughs> messages. And if they do, it's probably not in a timely manner. But, you know, the power plant, let's assume that they do that. Okay. So, yeah. For the CPU, we know already that we don't really like busy waiting. It's effort intensive for the CPU, uh, and it's wasting CPU time that actually another thread could most likely be putting to use. Um, ultimately, you know, the, the goal of the CPU is to get work done, uh, and if it's spending time checking if the you know, busy flag is true, even with tests and set, that's CPU cycles that could be going to something else. The approach of wait 15 minutes and try again is okay for a human, but isn't great for the computer uh, for whom time passes uh, much more slowly. Uh, if a thread A fails to enter into a critical section and then has a sleep for two full seconds, 2,000 milliseconds, before trying again, it might be the case that thread B is finished after 20 milliseconds. Don't forget, that's still a fairly long time for the computer. Uh, and thread A waits unnecessarily for 1,980 milliseconds. And that is ultimately a waste of time. Now, a task that could be done sooner is finished slower for well, no great reason. So we need a way to have the call me when you're finished kind of semantics of leaving this message. Um, it's The solution is, well, the semaphore. I guess you know, triumphant music plays while the semaphore uh, is introduced riding to our rescue in this, uh, in this movie. What is a semaphore? A semaphore is a system of signals used for communication. Why is it called a semaphore? Well, semaphore actually refers to flags uh, in terms of how uh, ships would communicate. So, listen, back in the like you know, sailing ship era, long before ships had radios, when two friendly ships are in visual range, they communicate with one another through flag semaphores. Uh, and semaphores are these flags that they hold in specific positions, uh, and uh, each ship uh, can see what the other person's, uh, what the other flag person's doing, and they can communicate letters and so and so on uh, at a distance. And that means the ships can communicate at visual range distance, and visual range distance can be enhanced with the use of like a telescope or, or something to that effect. Uh, and that works dramatically better than many alternatives, uh, such as shouting. Shouting is not super efficient in terms of communicating uh, on the high seas. Uh, you know, if you're just picturing, you know, being out on a calm lake, you know, yeah, sure, you can shout and people can hear you from many kilometers around. But when you're out on the sea, there's the wind, there's the water. Uh, it is the 1700s in this example, so probably there's cannon fire. You know, it's uh, it's not ideal. Shouting sounds you know, on its face like it might work okay, but visual communication actually works a lot better for this scenario. Uh, and this uh, helpful graphic actually shows you the semaphore alphabet uh, in that you can basically communicate any message by spelling a word uh, or an acronym or something like that based on how the flags are held. Uh, and based on how the flags are held, uh, they're held in a certain position. You note down, okay, yes, you know, that was an M, and then the next one, okay, yeah, that was a Q, uh, and so on and so on, until you have reached uh, the end of whatever message wants to send. And that's where the term semaphore comes from, uh, and it's, of course, not exactly the same as the uh, computer semaphore, but that's why it's called the way that it is. Okay, the computer semaphore was invented in 1965 by the very famous Dijkstra, a brilliant Dutch computer scientist who is very frequently insulted in textbooks. You know, they call him eccentric or unusual, and I don't know off the cuff why everybody has decided that that's how they want to describe him, and I think it's kind of mean. Um, but sure, you know, you go textbook authors, you kick that dead person. I'm sure, you know, his estate won't sue you. Um, Dijkstra described a data structure that can be used to solve synchronization problems via messages, uh, and although the version we use now is not exactly the same uh, as the original description, even though well, it's now like 50 
five plus years later, the core idea is unchanged. The idea being that we have some sort of signaling that's used to communicate between different threads or different processes, uh, and it is tremendously useful in solving all of our problems for synchronization. Okay, we're going to start off uh, conceptually with the binary semaphore. The binary semaphore has you know, an internal variable which has two values, uh, either 0 or 1, and it could be initialized to either one of those things. Uh, the semaphore has two operations, wait and post. Now, in the original paper, wait was called P and signal was called V. Um, the names in common usage have become more descriptive. Um, the names don't really make any sense unless you know Dutch, because Dijkstra was from the Netherlands, and P is short for proberen, which is to test, and V is short for verhogen, which is raise or increment. For historical reasons, as much as any other, the traditional common language, or lingua franca, uh, of computers is English, so the English names for things have tended to dominate. Uh, and uh, Dijkstra's original idea was that by giving them silly names, you wouldn't get confused with you know, the, the meanings of the words. I'm not sure that was a good argument. Um, I think probably calling them wait and post uh, are better than you know, sort of meaningless names, especially you know, when it's P and V and they rhyme, and it would be easy to mishear one of those things. Um, but hey, that's how it is. Now, it's also worth noting that although there's agreement, wait is always wait, post is called signal in many textbooks. You will find, I think, as we go through the course uh, on various occasions, I will say post, and on others I will say signal. Uh, I have tried uh, ever so briefly to um, just check all the notes and the slides to make them consistent in terms of language with post, but if you see signal, it means the same thing as post. Either of those is fine, uh, at least in a pseudocode example. The uh, terminology that you would use in an actual code example will depend on the implementation of the semaphore that you're working with. Uh, and by that same token, if you wrote signal in a pseudocode answer on an exam, it would be marked as equivalent to if you wrote post and vice versa. If you wrote post, it's the same as if you wrote signal in a pseudocode answer. Either one is fine, uh, and let's not get too caught up on it. In some cases, it just makes more sense in the sentence for me to say post, in some cases signal, so you will probably hear both. We'll start with wait. The wait operation is how a program tries to enter a critical section. Uh, and so you can think of it as being like wait your turn, uh, and therefore you wait for it to be your turn before you proceed to the critical section. When the wait function is invoked, if the semaphore internal value is 1, the value is set to 0, and this thread may enter the critical section and continue executing. If the semaphore is 0, that means another thread is in the critical section and the current thread must wait. And the magic in this that makes it not busy waiting is that when a thread calls wait and is not able to proceed right now, that thread is blocked by the operating system. Just the same as if it asked for memory or a disk operation, it gets blocked and can't proceed, uh, and other threads will get a chance to run. Uh, and wait is sometimes referred to as decrementing a semaphore because the value changes in the binary semaphore from 1 to 0. Okay. Post is the mirror image. The post or signal operation is how a program signals or indicates that it's finished with the critical section. Uh, it is, again, a sort of sending of a message. When this is invoked uh, on a binary semaphore, if the semaphore is 1, do nothing. Uh, if the semaphore is 0 and there is a task that is blocked awaiting that semaphore, that task is unblocked, but the internal value remains 0. Uh, and if nobody is waiting when post is called, then the semaphore's internal value is set to 1. This is also, of course, referred to as incrementing the semaphore. Okay, 
I don't think it's super surprising that you know when uh, when nobody's waiting, we set the value back from zero to one. But what's up with setting it, uh, not setting it actually when it's zero? Uh, the idea is that uh, the semaphore's value tells you whether anyone is in the critical section, uh, and when you signal and someone is waiting in line, that next thread that's waiting in line just proceeds immediately, so the semaphore remains in use. The critical section remains in use, uh, and it wouldn't be correct to set the value to 1 because we're just sort of handing it over to the next thread that gets a turn. Okay, maybe that's not a, maybe that's not a clear concept, maybe an analogy would help. So let's pretend that you like coffee and you like going to a particular coffee shop you know, with a fancy logo based perhaps on the west coast uh, and you can order your drink exactly the way that you like it. Uh, a friend of mine from high school uh, who worked uh, at, uh, at such a coffee shop had a customer who would come in uh, every day and order the half-calf, no-whip, extra-hot, extra-foam, two-shot soy milk latte. Okay. Makes no sense to me. I wouldn't order such a thing. But hey, maybe that's what you want. Maybe this is your favorite thing. Uh, and it's been hard to come by because, you know, you have been in a pandemic-related lockdown for the last month or so. Okay, so you enjoy this coffee. After this beverage, it might be the case that you need to use the washroom. Uh, and uh, if it's in a certain area of town, the washroom might be locked at such a place, usually because um, the store is worried that homeless people or non-customers are going to use the facilities. Uh, and uh, use the facilities in this case is not just a euphemism for like the usual thing, but is also perhaps like, you know, they're going to do heroin in the bathroom. Um, so if it's one of those uh, locations, then you need a key uh, and you can get a key to the washroom by asking one of the employees. Uh, and you know, this suggests, of course, that the key is you know, kept behind the counter. Uh, and the key is used to control access to the resource, the resource in this case being the washroom. So if nobody is currently using it, the staff will just give you the key and you can proceed. If it's currently occupied, you have to wait. When the key is returned, if anyone is waiting, the employee will give the key to the first person in line who wanted to use the washroom. Uh, otherwise, they put the key away behind the counter. So that's kind of analogous to the semaphore. Uh, in this case, we, you know, we have the, the semaphore controls access to the critical section, the critical section being this resource. Uh, and if you request the semaphore, if it's not currently in use, you get it. You can proceed. If it is in use, you have to wait. When the person using the resource is finished with it, when they exit from the critical section, then that makes it the next person's turn and they can get the resource, the critical section, and continue. Uh, and if nobody is waiting when the last person is finished, well, then the resource just becomes available again. Now, nobody is holding on to this semaphore. Okay. So I hope that analogy helped to clarify at least a little bit. Now, it is noteworthy that the operating system is required to make this work as expected. If a thread A attempts to wait on a semaphore, it gets blocked, and that is you know, the operating system is getting involved and saying, okay, we're going to block this thread until such time as it is unblocked. Uh, and uh, the operating system knows that it cannot schedule thread A to run because it is missing a resource that it needs so that it can proceed. Uh, and when thread B is finished with the critical section and it signals the semaphore, that unblocks A and allows it to run again. Now, one of the things that is worth noting uh, when I go back to the uh, previous example about the caffeine, I said when the key is, uh, is being returned, if anyone is waiting, the employee gives it to the first person in line. We do not necessarily have that guarantee about the semaphore. It is not necessarily a first come, first serve behavior. So if thread A enters the critical section and while it's in there, threads B and C arrive, we'll say in that order, it is possible that when A leaves the critical section, it unblocks C, even though B got there first. 
this is just down to how the semaphore is implemented and we will have to um, come back to that topic a little bit later um, in particular uh, again putting money in the swear jar if you wanted to talk about this in, in a lot more detail uh, that would come up in EC 459 the technical elective that uh, builds on this but okay um, so another thing that's worth remembering about the semaphore is that there isn't a facility to check the current value. You can't ask in advance, you know, hey, semaphore, what's your value right now? It, it wouldn't tell you anyway, uh, and there wouldn't be a point to it. A thread doesn't know in advance if it's going to block when it waits on a semaphore. It's either you try... Uh, and you get blocked, uh, or you try and you succeed and you are able to enter into the critical section. What's that about? Um, it's, it's just the case that uh, if you check the value of the semaphore and then you make a decision based on that information, by the time you make the decision, the thing that you checked is maybe out of date. Maybe something else has happened in the meantime. Uh, and another thread has come by and has uh, entered the critical section. So the information you have is out of date and it was worthless. That's why there is no facility to check the current value. Uh, and when a thread posts on the semaphore, it does not know whether any other threads are waiting. You don't know if there's anybody in line after you, so to speak. And there isn't really a facility to check that either. This is not to say that the semaphore doesn't maintain this information somehow, or you know, the operating system maintains it on behalf of the semaphore, uh, in that you know, we do actually have to keep track somewhere of uh, you know, what is the current state of the semaphore, uh, and is anyone waiting, or any threads uh, waiting on this semaphore. There is a way of maintaining that, but as a caller, as a user of this scenario, there's no way to check and see what threads are waiting or how many threads are waiting. Uh, and when thread A signals on a semaphore, as I previously mentioned, uh, there's no way of knowing uh, what thread is going to continue, uh, which thread will get unblocked. Okay. Now, the thing is that a semaphore is like a seatbelt. It is a safety mechanism that only works if you use it correctly. So, you know, uh, the manufacturer of your car gives you all kinds of information in the manual telling you about the importance of using seatbelts. Uh, you will have seen you know, public service announcements uh, about buckle up. There, there are signs on the side of the road. Uh, all these things are reminders and encouragements for you to do the right thing. But if you don't, uh, and there is a car crash, you could still die or be seriously injured. Uh, and the consequences are maybe less dire in your program uh, in that if you do not use semaphores correctly you can get wrong answers you know, corrupt data other uh, program problems so you do have to use them correctly the fact that the semaphore exists is not enough to safeguard uh, your program your data uh, your uh, execution you have to use them and you have to use them correctly so, I mean, suppose that thread C is you know, going to enter the critical section, uh, and the programmer of this task is both malicious as well as impatient, you know, mustache-twirling villain here. You know, My task is far too important to wait for those other processes and threads, he says, um, you know, in that old-timey villain voice for you know, tying people up to train tracks. Um, and so he implements his code such that before he waits on the semaphore, he calls post immediately. Uh, and even though A or B might be in the critical section, the semaphore uh, is incremented or another thread is unblocked. Uh, and he's fairly certain that his program will now get to enter into the critical section. Or you could just, you know, again in the uh, villain... Uh, uh, villain monologue here, just not use the semaphore at all and you know, enter a critical section regardless. Thing is, it's not foolproof. Um, even if you call post on the semaphore to um, you know, try to increase your chances of not having to wait, 
you might wake up another thread uh, instead of C, and it depends on the scheduler. Um, but whatever you know, villainous scheme you had in mind here as, uh, as the author of thread C, um, all kinds of havoc could result by letting another process into the critical section, whether it's your own or whether it is another process, perhaps an unrelated process. Uh, or uh, perhaps another thread, or perhaps something else. Thing is, the example here makes the author of Thread C a scheming villain because it's much more entertaining that way, uh, you know, where I get to uh, tell the story and you know, say it in a funny voice, and you know, it, it hopefully is a little bit more memorable. But what actually happens in real life is it is a programming error. You, know, you have forgotten to uh, put the uh, wait and post calls around uh, a critical section, uh, or you were unaware that this was a critical section in the first place, or someone has made a, a change uh, that makes some variable shared unexpectedly, uh, or uh, there's just you know, some workflow uh, where you know, deep down in some function, post gets called and you know, it happens to happen before wait it's much more likely that it's just you know an innocent programming error as opposed to you know mustache twirling evil villain so one of the ways that we could prevent bad behavior uh, is by supplementing the basic binary semaphore uh, and the data structure that we would use for this is a mutex uh, and a mutex is a binary semaphore with an additional rule that says only the uh, only the thread that called wait is the uh, thread that can call post. So if you were the one who decremented the semaphore by wait, uh, then if somebody else tries to post on it, that will be an error that might be rejected because obviously that was a programming error of some sort and shouldn't happen. Typically, when we have a mutex as opposed to just a binary semaphore, uh, the verbs for this are lock and unlock. We will talk about the mutex in a tremendous amount more detail very soon. Um, but uh, either way, if this is implemented, you could use just a regular semaphore, recognizing that it doesn't have this little extra safeguard. Uh, it does add uh, a little bit of extra bookkeeping to the semaphore because it has to keep track of who called this and who called that, but usually we judge it to be a reasonable price to pay. Let's examine a scenario where something could go wrong uh, when we have a more than one concurrent invocation of a particular function. So let's suppose that we have a linked list example. And this linked list is you know, a singly linked list. It has a head and a tail. It has a size. Uh, and it is composed of single node uh, structures. Uh, and a single node has a, and a pointer to an element, so some data, whatever it is. Uh, and it has a next pointer, which points to the next element in the list. So our list has a head, it has a tail, it has a size, uh, and there is an initialization function that sets the head and the tail to be null and the size to be zero. Okay, that part's fine. Then we're going to look at the push front function. There are no doubt other functions to uh, manipulate the list, but we will imagine here just for the sake of the example that we are interested only in push front because that's all we need to illustrate our problem. So if only one thread is going to access this data structure at a time uh, or any one particular instance of the single list, then we don't have a problem, but it's shared. Okay, so I want you to, uh, again, using your uh, detective skills, take a look at this. Uh, and think about what could go wrong if there were two concurrent invocations of push front. So thread A calls push front, and thread B concurrently, you know, using our known definition of concurrency in the formal sense, also calls push front. Uh, and if you want a little hint about that, think about when would be a bad time for a thread switch to occur. It might also help if you haven't spotted you know, what could go wrong to uh, sort of just write down on a piece of paper or you know, type up a little bit 
uh, some values for variables. You can you know make up dummy numbers for things if you're so inclined, uh, and uh, just you know update them as you go through the different steps, so you can sort of trace what's going on in, in execution. All right, so I will tell you now that the problem that we could encounter is that right before the increment of size, so on the second last line here in this uh, in this function here uh, before plus plus uh, list size takes place, there is a possibility that a thread switch occurs here. So thread A runs push front and we do have to assume an initial condition, and I'll say the initial condition is the list is empty. So we create a new single node. We you know, check if malloc failed, it did not, fine. We set up the uh, values here, so the element is assigned this new pointer, uh, and next uh, is assigned list head, which is null. List head is assigned temp. If list size is zero, this is true because we have just said that the list is empty initially in this scenario. Uh, list tail is assigned to temp. So if you picture uh, a little bit what that looks like, uh, it looks something like the diagram here at the bottom when we get to that thread switch, which happens after tail is assigned. So right before that, um, the new node has been allocated. It's shown as A in the diagram. The pointers of head and tail have been updated, and the size is zero. Okay, then at this point, thread B calls push front. Uh, so allocate the new node. We'll assume it did not fail, so skip the if block. Uh, set up the new node. So the element here is going to be called B. Uh, set next to be the head of the list. The head of the list is currently A. Uh, and then the head of the list is set to the new node, which is B. And if list size is zero, well, list size is still zero because that hasn't been changed yet. So the list tail is assigned to temp. So the list tail is now pointing to the node we have just created. We'll increment list size to be one and return true. When we resume execution from thread A, list size is incremented and goes to two and we return true. So yeah, if the second thread executes and adds B to the linked list, the tail pointer is updated and it looks like this. The head is pointing to B, the tail is pointing to B, uh, B has a next pointer of A, and then size is one. And finally, when the first thread runs again, it resumes where it left off uh, and it increments the size integer, leaving us with a final state where head and tail point to B, but size is two. This is what we call an inconsistent state. That is, the state of the data structure does not agree with itself. Uh, head and tail being the same thing should indicate that you know, either if they're both null, there's nothing in the list, or uh, if, there's, if they're not null, then it is the same element. That means there's only one item. But size equals two is not consistent with head and tail being at the same thing. So um, when we try to work with this linked list, it will reveal the problem. Um, let's say that attempting to remove an element from the list will reveal it. Um, if the remove function checks to see if head and tail are equal, then uh, it will return B and set these things to null, and then we lose A. It's a memory leak, and moreover, our data structure is just incorrect. It doesn't contain what we think it should contain. So if A was, oh, I don't know, your course grade in this course, and it just magically disappeared, would you be very happy about that? Yeah, I, I didn't think so. Um, alternatively, the head pointer is updated uh, because we look at size and we see it's two, and we say, oh, well, then you know, don't update the tail. But then the head pointer is now pointing to A, and the tail pointer is pointing to B, even after B has been deallocated, which could result in a segmentation fault or some sort of uh, overwriting of other memory. Not okay either. So, um, 
yeah, the, the problem might manifest itself differently depending on the implementation of any function that wants to work with this now inconsistent linked list. If you just wrote a visitor that said, you know, go to the head uh, in a for loop and while uh, next is not null, go to the next one, then you would see there are two elements and you would print them out and that would, you know, that would work just fine. Um, but it's entirely dependent on the implementation and that's the problem with uh, an inconsistent data structure, the behavior is not always the same depending on the implementation. So we need to avoid that and we need to fix that. So again, like play heroic music because you know, the semaphore is writing to the rescue here. This problem can easily be solved with the deployment of a semaphore. But I have to take a little divergence to talk about the counting or general semaphore. Uh, and it is a, well, generalization of the binary semaphore. Uh, and that means that instead of having only the values of zero and one, the setup routine for the counting semaphore allows us to choose a value. Now in, uh, in a textbook scenario, the um, the general semaphore's uh, initial value is its maximum value, but that's not the case in Unix. Uh, the uh, choice of the integer is just its initial value. Uh, and uh, now wait and post work a little bit differently. Not dramatically differently, but a little bit differently. Uh, and that is, if a thread attempts to uh, wait on a semaphore, that decrements the integer counter by one, always. Uh, and a thread that signals on the semaphore increments the integer by one, always, even if threads are waiting, and even if there's a, a big lineup. Uh, if a thread attempts to wait on a semaphore and the decrement operation would make the integer value negative, so either it goes to negative one uh, or it goes to um, negative 10, doesn't matter very much, the calling thread is blocked. Uh, and uh, if the uh, semaphore is, for example, initialized with five and its current value is two, a thread that calls wait on the general semaphore decrements its value, so the new value becomes one, but that's not negative, so it does not get blocked. If the general semaphore's current value is one, decremented, the value goes to zero, but again, that's not negative, so the caller does not get blocked. If the current value of the semaphore is zero, uh, and a caller calls wait, value goes to negative one, the caller gets blocked. And just for completeness, if the value of the semaphore is currently minus 10, this indicates there's basically a long lineup for the semaphore, uh, and a caller calls wait, the caller decrements it, it becomes negative 11, and the caller gets blocked. So yeah, uh, if a thread attempts to wait and the decrement operation makes the integer value negative, the caller is blocked. However, it can have a very high positive value as well. The semaphore can have a value of 25, and that means the next 25 times that wait is called, no one will get blocked, even if there are no signals in between. Now in some operating systems, there's no distinction between a binary and counting semaphore, so if you want a semaphore uh, to you know, have a value of one, you just choose it to have a value of one. In Unix, the semaphore that we work with is a general semaphore, and they are always general. So let's look at our syntax for how this works. Honestly, the syntax for a semaphore is very straightforward given what we already know. There are four functions, but I don't have to make four distinct slides in which I break down to you in painful detail all of the ways in which you use a semaphore. There is an initialization function, a destroy function, a wait function, and a post function. Okay. So the wait function and the post function just take a pointer to the semaphore that you want to wait on or post on respectively. That doesn't really require any explanation, I don't think, since we should now have an understanding of how the wait and post operations work. The destroy is the mirror image to the init function. So when a semaphore is initialized, there is a corresponding cleanup function and that is sem destroy and it takes a pointer to the semaphore that you want to get rid of. Seminit is the only one that is new or interesting. 
in that you know there are additional parameters. So it takes a pointer to the SEMT memory. You, know, you have to allocate it somewhere, but this initializes it. Again, the internals of the semaphore are, again, an opaque uh, structure, so we don't know anything about its internals, but that's okay because we have an init function. The second parameter is shared, which will be either zero or one. Zero is used in the case where this is not shared, uh, and that is to say it's only going to be used within this process. Uh, if it's shared between threads, uh, then a value of shared for zero is fine, uh, but you need shared to be one if it's shared between different processes, such as if you put this semaphore into shared memory and it's going to coordinate between different processes. That is a valid use of the semaphore, uh, and in that case, you, know, you should be sure to set shared to one, otherwise it doesn't work as expected. So uh, only if it's going to be put in shared memory, set shared to one, otherwise zero. Uh, and then the third parameter is the initial value of the semaphore. Uh, and uh, that is exactly what it sounds like. The internal uh, counter of the semaphore will be initialized to whatever value is provided here. I want to take a moment to point out the importance of getting the initial value correct. If you choose the wrong initial value, the behavior of your program is similarly not going to be what you expect. If you chose an initial value that is uh, zero when it should have been one, that might mean that no thread ever enters the critical section because they all get blocked. If you chose a value of 25 when it should have been one, that might mean that mutual exclusion does not work as expected because many threads got into the critical section when it should have been only one at a time. So your choice of initial value is very important. Uh, and when we do an example, whether it's in pseudocode or in actual code, uh, and you create a semaphore, you always have to specify what is the initial value of the semaphore. If you don't specify, I don't know what it is, and you know, that would be marked as incorrect in an exam situation. Uh, and obviously in a, you know, a situation where you write code, you have to provide an initial value to seminit, uh, but then you have to choose the right one. Given what we know, how do we apply the semaphore to this example of the linked list? Okay, let's scroll back just briefly to our code. We'll want to associate a semaphore with the linked list itself, so we should probably you know, add a semaphore type to the struct definition of single list. So let's say that we do that. Then we need a proper initialization of it in single list init. Uh, and so we'll, we'll assume in this case we're talking about multiple threads in the same process, so we don't need shared to be anything other than zero. But what do we choose for our initial value? Okay, I hope you said one. The idea of using the semaphore to protect a critical section like this is such that we want the initial value to be one. It means that a thread can enter into the critical section uh, and then proceed and, when, and that decrements the semaphore to zero. So the next thread that comes by will get blocked. And then uh, a uh, post happens later at some point, which unblocks uh, the next thread, increments the value, uh, and when everybody's done, the value returns to one. Okay, so how do we apply it in our function? Assuming that we have uh, created it and initialized it correctly, and uh, we'll also assume that we have a destroy correctly, we've got to put wait and post somewhere in this code. Uh, and again, I want you to take a minute and think about where those belong. If you're not sure about how to place them, think about what needs to be in a critical section and what doesn't.
Okay. So let's look and see about our, uh, our solution. All right, so let's imagine that we did this. Uh, so single node is allocated up at the top. If temp is null, return false. Uh, and then temp uh, element is assigned object. Then we have our sem wait statement. So we will wait. Uh, and then there is an opening curly brace. Uh, and then we have our critical section, uh, which is enclosed within these curly braces. Uh, in that section, temp next is assigned list head. List head is assigned temp. If list size is equal to zero, list tail is assigned temp. Uh, increment list size, and then we get to the sem post statement. Now, okay, this is the one and only time we're going to do this, um, but in some style guides, these uh, opening and closing curly braces around critical sections are recommended. In C, this is referred to as manual scoping. You can do all kinds of bad things with manual scoping, I suppose, if you enjoy being evil. Um, but it is, in this case, a way to make it clear where the critical section is and to allow syntax highlighting of your editor to help you out a little bit. Because it's usually the case in any uh, IDE or uh, Notepad++ or Vim or something like that, that if you have one of the curly braces selected, it will highlight its partner for you. Uh, and that sort of thing can be helpful in making sure you know exactly what's in the critical section and where the post and the wait statements uh, that are related belong. We're, like I said, not going to do this uh, anywhere else, but if you see that somewhere uh, in a coding style guide uh, or you know, in a co-op term or full-time employment, you see this as a rule, you know why. That's what it's for. That is its purpose. Um, so, okay, we have to evaluate uh, if what we did worked, first of all, uh, and then we can talk about whether or not it's optimal. So, did this work? Well, okay. Um, we encountered a problem previously where we had a thread switch uh, immediately before the increment of the list size. Uh, and if that does happen, if the time slice for thread A expires so here after the assignment statement where uh, list tail uh, is assigned temp, then a second thread, thread B, would run and it would allocate here single node T check if it's null, skip that, uh, assign this object, and then call sem wait, and would get blocked. Because the semaphore was one, when thread A entered the critical section, the value was decremented to zero. Thread B tries to call sem wait, uh, and the value was zero, so it gets decremented to negative one, and that's a negative number, meaning thread B gets blocked. Okay, thread B can't continue, can't enter the critical section. Thread A will eventually get another turn. Thread A will increment list size, then post. That unblocks thread B. Thread B will then be able to continue, uh, and it will add its element to the list. So I think that does what we need it to do, and I think you could argue that for any scenario uh, wherever the thread switch happens to take place within our function. But we got to ask ourselves, did we cover everything that we need to cover? So we have to make a determination about what is a shared statement. Uh, if I go back to the original, um, you would uh, have a slightly harder time spotting what is a shared statement, but this, this will suffice. Um, so the list itself is shared. The object is not, uh, and so the single node temp is not shared because it's only created uh, in, this, uh, in this call of this function, uh, and setting temp element is not shared. Um, but here, uh, list head, that is shared data, and here it's being read. List head is being assigned on the next line, List size is being read here. List tail is being assigned in this line, uh, and list size is being modified. It's a read, modify, write with plus plus uh, on this line as well. So all of those things are shared data in some way. It could be either a read or a write. Both of those count, both of those matter. So those will need to be inside the critical section. What about the statements that are outside? Well, temp element doesn't 
reference anything that is shared. Uh, this check of if temp is null, return false, doesn't reference anything that's shared. And this uh, memory allocation at the top also does not reference anything that is shared. So those don't have to be in the critical section. In fact, in some cases, it's really bad to put things in that don't need to be there. Under normal circumstances, you want your critical section to be as small as possible, but still enclose all of the shared memory accesses, which include, as I say, both reads and writes. If you don't believe me about reads being important, uh, if some wait took place here uh, af after this statement here, uh, after temp next is assigned uh, list head, uh, and some wait took place here, thread A could run this statement uh, and read the value for the head of the list uh, and assign it to the next value, then get blocked uh, and wait some long period of time before getting unblocked and assigning list head to be temp but temp's next pointer is an old value of list head, which is now out of date uh, and is not correct. So that should, I hope, uh, motivate you to agree with me that uh, even a read of a shared variable needs to be included in there. But we also don't want to include things that don't need to be in there. Um, so there, if, if you put this uh, statement here uh, of temp uh, element is assigned object inside the critical section, it wouldn't be wrong. I would not in this course deduct marks and say, well, you had an unnecessary statement in the critical section. Uh, in programming for performance, yes, another dollar in the swear jar. Uh, that would actually be viewed negatively because you're making the critical section bigger and it's slowing down your program. A small amount, sure, but you should you know, do everything you can to speed it up. But in this course, putting more things in the critical section is not usually a problem. Uh, it's, um, I would be fine if you err on the side of caution and put a statement like temp element is assigned object in the critical section when it doesn't need to be, rather than leave something that should be in the critical section out. There are, however, a couple of pitfalls uh, about what happens if you put sem weight just at the top of the function. Um, it, you could say, well, uh, I want to enclose the whole function in this. So I'm going to put sem weight as the first statement and then uh, sem post as the last one before return. Um, that un enforces unnecessary waiting, sure. Um, but including the call to malloc is especially bad because memory allocation itself can block if for some reason there is no memory available. And it means other threads can't enter the critical section and you might get stuck entirely. There is another risk that is also worth worrying about, uh, and it is this other earlier return statement here in the program. So if sem wait took place before this check of if temp is null, uh, and there was a return false statement here, that would be a problem uh, because we never get to the sem post and then we return without uh, signaling, uh, without posting on this semaphore. And that means that no other thread will ever be able to enter into this and any thread that calls push front just gets blocked hopelessly. So we have to be very careful about making sure that there is always going to be a call to post when we have called wait. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to have our program work as expected. So we do have to pay careful attention to the flow of control um, in the same way that you have to pay attention to uh, memory allocation, uh, that every allocation has to eventually get to a free, uh, every weight has to get to a post. If you don't always make a malloc get to a free, the problem is not immediately visible because it's just a memory leak and your program might work fine, but you know, its memory needs sort of climb over time. Getting the wait post thing correct is more important because if you don't get to the post statement, then your program will at some point eventually get stuck. Uh, and that will be much more noticeable uh, as opposed to just you know, a minor annoyance. Okay, so we've got an introduction on how to use the semaphore. The only thing we didn't show is how to destroy it, but you can assume that if there is a linked list destroy function, uh, it would call sem destroy in exactly the way that you would expect. It takes only one argument and doesn't require a lot of explaining. In our next topic, which is on synchronization patterns, we're going to take a look at how to apply a semaphore 
to a general kind of problem. A synchronization pattern uh, is one of those common scenarios, and if you can look at your program and you can say, oh, this part of the program resembles this common scenario, then I know how to apply the semaphore to that problem. So that's it for now. See you in the next video.